Good morning, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's be the voice and be glad in it. <laughs> it is a beautiful day, isn't it? After a couple of days of slugging it out through the rain and sleet and whatever else that was sent our way, God just opened up the skies. It's a beautiful sunny day, and here we are to worship. Uh, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be a beautiful service today. God has been working in advance and has sent the Spirit to be with us now. We welcome you if you are visiting, and I would call your attention to your bulletins. The inside cover acts as our calendar and our announcements for the week. I specifically want to lift up War Room, which is a movie about the power of prayer, specifically highlighting a family and a marriage. And that is a showing tonight here in this Wesley Hall at 4 o'clock. And then again on Wednesday at 6.30. We're kind of excited about this and just know that God's going to use that in a mighty way. In your bulletin, I think it calls this War Games. That was a different movie. But uh, this, is, this is about prayer and the power of God to hear and answer in miraculous ways our prayers. There are obviously other announcements in here opportunities for you to learn and grow and serve and be served. Is there anyone that has a specific announcement that they would like to lift up? Bill, do you have the capability of putting up the picture of the Lenten study about the bait of Satan, which is a book that I am inviting people to go through with me during the Wednesdays of Lent starting on the 17th? It's okay if there's, that image isn't ready, but I'll tell you that next Sunday in your bulletin there will be an insert and an opportunity for you to register for that. I, Marshall, I'm glad you're standing. Yes, sir. Thank you. That is an invitation from the trustees here at 1215. So those of you who go and have something to eat after this service, come on back as part of the church family. This has to do with the old sanctuary building and some crumbling and some repairs that have already begun. If you've seen tarps and dirt and tracks, uh, that's what's happening. And this is about you learning just what exactly is the need there. Today is a special day where we are going to be led primarily in our worship time and the message is coming from Reverend Scott Wilkinson and so he's going to be uh, all over the place this morning and I'm going to be down with Justin just worshiping and being among you. Let's pray. Gracious God, it is good to be in your house this morning. As the psalmist wrote, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. So would you pour out your spirit on us now and on this gathering that this would be something pleasing to you and that you would certainly let us know that you are God and we are your children. In the name of Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship our Lord this morning. We have a great and awesome and wonderful God. And I don't know about you, but I just think it's such a wonderful thing to be able to say, my life is in you. God, God's a lot stronger than me. And uh, boy, to be able to just say, Lord, here it is. I'm putting my life in your hands. Uh, I hope that this song that starts things off is also a prayer for us. Yeah. 
special prayer request. Isn't it awesome that people are praying while we're in here worshiping? Wow, that's just amazing. Prayer is wonderful. Come see the movie. <laughs> Come see the movie this afternoon. I um, think it's pretty awesome that this many people got up and came to church this morning. Well, that's awesome. After too. yesterday, yeah, I was like true. sleeping. <laughs> Amen.
Lord, it is such a, such a wonder, such an awe, such an amazing thing that you would come to earth in the person of Jesus Christ to win us back to you, back into your heart. Lord, may we just run and jump into your arms with abandon. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. like the theme today is prayer and uh, I was thinking about it before I walked up here and I, I realized I've, I've been involved in a luncheon on Wednesday with a group of men for 22 years that, that surprised me I didn't realize it was that long page we meet every Wednesday we're from different denominations we pray heartily we have a good time we have our lunch and we go back to work and it's a, a great group that keeps us accountable to each other great group to rely on when we have struggles and just a great group to minister to when someone else hasn't so as we talk about prayer and praise concerns this morning let's see who has either boy this church is doing well nobody has any <laughs> yeah We continue to lift up Danny Allen. He, if you ask him, he just says he's making progress every day and he has been kept at home. He needs to be uh, behaving himself. He has an important visit with a doctor on Tuesday where he will learn more about perhaps how he can come back and be among us again some more. But he and June continue to stand in the need of prayer Leslie Mills, uh, also part of our church family and leadership, is home. She has had uh, breast cancer surgery on Friday, and that was a real long couple of days for her, but she is now home and resting and recovering. So we lift those two people up from the leadership of the congregation and ask for your continued support uh, for those functions that, that they usually do that other people are standing up and taking care of. Um, like to remember Dorothy Barker, who is Janice Rich's mother, um, who's in hospice care in Greenville now. Okay. Thank you. There are others. And um, Jan Sparrow had a heart attack and is at um, Vidant in Greenville getting ready to have surgery. So if y'all would pray for her, she's going to have double bypass. Okay. Jan Sparrow. Uh Well, Hillary's making it easy for me. I just ask you to keep the family of um, Linda Alley good in your prayers. Um, she was an operating room nurse at the hospital with three young girls who was killed in the car accident about a week ago. Just keep their family and our operating room staff in your prayers. Others? Let's bow our heads in. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for this weather, for the weather to come, for the, the grace and mercy that you offer each, each of us that allows us to draw closer to you after we fail. Lord, we'll close with the prayer that you taught us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Children to come, well, it's now time for the children to come forward, and we'll have a little time together around the water. So come up here and let's talk about water. Water is necessary. Where there is no water, there is no life. You can't drink it, but you can look at it. Now, whenever we do a baptism in the United Methodist Church, there's a there's a little prayer we pray over the water, and it reminds us of all the different ways in the Bible that water is used. God brought creation in the Genesis story out of the chaos of water. Creation came. The children of Israel, when they were slaves in Egypt, God, I am, I might have you do it. When they were slaves in Egypt, God led them through the water of the Red Sea into safety. When John the Baptist came preaching, he had a baptism of repentance in water where people would come, be baptized, and make a new commitment to live for God and leave their sinful life behind. Lots of stories in the New Testament about water, Jesus walking on the water, the woman at the well who left her pitcher because she had living water from Jesus. The early church, the earliest believers, they used water baptism to not only be a sign of repentance from sin and turning from sin and living a new life, but the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're going to pour this water. You going to help me, Ryan? We'll do it together. We're going to pour this water into the bowl as a reminder that God poured out the Holy Spirit. And now, and now, God can come and live within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And water is a symbol of that too. All right, so here we go. You ready? Water in the bowl. Here we go. Help me. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Pick it up. All right. That's a lot of water. <laughs> That's a lot of water. Did you get a little bit on you? Yeah. That's all right. Later on in the service, we're going to use this water as a reminder of God's grace, His love, and His gift of love and mercy to every single one of us. Okay? We're going to do that a little bit later on. Can you see what that says right there? Can anybody read it? Can you read it? What does it say? I am trusting in the grace of God. I am trusting in the grace of God. You think we can all say that together? I am trusting in the grace of God. That's what this water symbolizes, God's grace to us. Let's have a little prayer. Dear God, thank you for the symbol of water a sign of your grace, your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. Thank you. running all around here just a little bit nervous. Like Jim said, I'm juggling a lot of balls this, this morning. And uh, Tom Atkins said, hey, it's not your first rodeo. <laughs> it's not my first rodeo. I've, I've preached many times. But you know, it is, it's an awesome privilege uh, and I, I don't care whether you've preached a thousand sermons 
to stand in front of folks and to proclaim what you believe is God's word for them and for you, that's an awesome responsibility. But I praise God for the opportunity. There's just one verse for our scripture lesson this morning. Romans 5, 8. But God proves his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God proves his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think you can take Paul's entire message of the gospel of Jesus and boil it down in, in, into that one verse. And of all the verses in the scriptures, my goodness, there's thousands, I think that verse more than any other gives us a picture of what grace is. I'm going to talk about grace and I'm going to talk about baptism. When the church baptizes someone, should the emphasis be on what they have done or on what God has done? I'm talking about baptism and I'm talking about grace. Is baptism the outward invisible sign that you have accepted Christ or that Christ has accepted you? which is the greater miracle. Okay, there was this average sort of guy and he was uh, walking down the street and he was just so distraught and worried how he was going to make ends meet now that he had lost his job. And along comes this very well-dressed man in a nice gray suit carrying a briefcase, comes up to him, calls him by name, and explains to him that he, this man in the suit, represents a billionaire, not Donald Trump, a billionaire who gives away a million dollars in cash in a briefcase to people who are in financial struggles. And today, this guy is the guy. And the man in the suit says the only, the only requirement is that you receive it and enjoy the blessings that it gives. Well, the man obviously was shocked, but he took the cash, ran home to his wife, burst through the door. Honey, you'll never believe it. Our financial problems are over. There was this guy, I was walking down the street, I was so worried, he comes up in a gray suit, a briefcase, represents this billionaire, has a million dollars, gives it to people. I was the guide for today. All I had to do, he said, was receive it and enjoy the blessings it gives. And darling, guess what? I received it. I took it. Our financial problems are over. I took the money. And the wife, of course, very bewildered and shocked as well, said, well, of course you took it, stupid. Well, who was this benefactor? Well, did you get his name? We need to thank him. Well, well no, I, I forgot about asking for his name. I just, but our financial problems are over. When someone is baptized, who is the hero of the story? The one who receives the free gift of salvation or the one who died, shed his blood on Calvary's cross to make salvation possible. In the early church, there is a bit of an evolution in the understanding of baptism. We see it in, in the New Testament. In the beginning, John the baptizer preaches a baptism of repentance, telling people to come to the water, leave their former sinful life behind, take on a new life committed to God. 
Jesus begins his ministry very much the same, calling people to repent, believe the good news of God's forgiveness and salvation, be baptized. Even on the day of Pentecost, Simon Peter, Acts chapter 2, after the Holy Spirit had fallen on the 120 believers in the upper room, he tells the people out in the street who have gathered to see what all the commotion is about, he says, repent and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as we have for the promise of forgiveness and the Holy Spirit is for you, it's for your children. That's interesting. Forgiveness of sins, outpouring of the Holy Spirit for your children. And for all who are far off, all whom God calls to himself. Has God called you to himself? Is he calling you right now at this very moment to respond to his gift of salvation and grace? Have you answered that call? If not, why not? And after they received the Holy Spirit, they were baptized in water and welcomed into the family of God. There is here still a strong emphasis on repentance, turning from sin, believing in the good news of salvation, but now there is a connection between water baptism and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that part of God that can come and live within us. Do you see what I'm saying? There's kind of an evolution in the understanding of baptism. Now it's connected with the Holy Spirit coming and living within us, and connecting us together as the family of God. There's an emphasis on God calling us not only into a relationship with himself, which this Holy Spirit apparently can make possible, but also a new relationship with one another. The family of God, the church, connected by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 19, we read that Paul was traveling to Ephesus, and he found some Christian believers, but it, they were lacking something. It's a great chapter, chapter 19 of Acts. They were lacking something, and they believed all the right stuff about Jesus, that he was the Son of God, that he came down to earth, he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose for our salvation, but they did not know that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, could come and live within us. In fact, when Paul asked them about the indwelling Christ and the Holy Spirit, they said, we've never even heard anything about the Holy Spirit. And Paul immediately said, well, into what were you baptized? And they said, in John's baptism for repentance. And Paul explained to them, there's more to baptism than just turning from sin, making a determination in your mind to live for God each day. There's also the indwelling Christ, God in you, the hope of glory. A part of baptism is receiving the Holy Spirit. It connects us together with God, connects us together as brothers and sisters in the family of God. It's a spiritual thing, a supernatural thing that only God can do. That's why we call it a sacrament, a sacred thing. We can't do this on our own. That's why we call it grace, an act of grace. Very quickly, then, we see that baptism became more than just an individual act of repentance and belief, but a community act of initiation into the body of Christ. 
where we celebrate what God has done, that that we could not do on our own. The last bit of the evolution of baptism we see in the New Testament and through the, the early church, I believe, had to do with infants and young children. If baptism is a formal initiation into the family of God, well, what about infants and children? The early church remembered that Jesus said, remember the little children, let them come to me, do not stop them. The kingdom of God belongs to such ones as these. The early Christians, the early church, also said, well, we're not going to be raising our children as pagan children. <laughs> we're going to raise them in the family. We're going to be raising them as Christian children. As a result, we read over and over in the book of Acts about the baptism of the whole household. Acts 16, 15. Lydia became a Christian. She was baptized with her whole household. Acts 16, 33, the Philippian jailer became a Christian. He and his entire household baptized without delay, it says. Acts 18, 8, the head of the synagogue in Corinth became a Christian. Paul baptized him and his whole household, and on and on. And if God is the hero of the story, and baptism is a sign of what God has done, then what better way to celebrate God's grace than to extend baptism to those who can't do one thing to earn it, one thing to deserve it. Many of you know or have read the books of Henry now and Henry Nouwen says this very thing when talking about baptizing people with severe mental challenges. He says, it's all about grace anyway. It's all about grace anyway. Self-righteousness has absolutely no part in baptism and no part in our walk of faith. If Jesus got mad about anything, aside from the money changers, he got mad at hypocrites, those that pretended to be holy when really they were just ordinary folks like you and me. Salvation is a gift. It's all about grace. We were not the ones who went up on Calvary's cross and shed our blood, and it wouldn't have made one bit of difference if we had been. The miracle of salvation is not that I, Scott Wilkinson, accepted Christ when I was 10 years old while watching Billy Graham on TV, or that I accepted Christ again when I was 13 at a revival at Kitty Hawk United Methodist Church, or that I really, really accepted Christ on August 11, 1973 at 8.45 in the evening in a little Presbyterian chapel at Kill Devil Hills. The real miracle of salvation is that God accepted me 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross. You can count on that. Mm, you can put your faith right smack on that one. If I repented of my sin and became baptized as a sign of my repentance, then what do I do the next time I need to repent of my sins? Do I need to be baptized again? Does Christ need to go up on the cross one more time? I don't think so. Because God was faithful the first time. <laughs> and God was faithful to me all through those rebellious years. Amen? Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know? Yeah, you were this nice little innocent baby back there, and that was great. And God made a commitment to you. And then, boy, all hell broke loose. You know? Well, not with God. God was faithful. All we're talking about is what baptism means. For the Methodist, it means a little different than it does with some other denominations. We put the emphasis on grace. That's all. Baptism is a sign of grace, what God has done. 
And that is true whether the person being baptized is a teenager, a little bitty baby, a great-great-grandmother. Here's what we are saying. Here is one for whom Jesus Christ has died. Here is one whom God has provided the gift of salvation. Here is one for whom God has poured out the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. For this one. Here is one whom God is calling to be a follower, a disciple, to grow in that faith, to become a witness to others. That's true. Whether it's a little bitty baby or a great-great-grandmother. So what is our response? One thing. Trusting in the grace of God. For today, this day, this moment, right now, your response is one thing. Trust in the grace of God. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Trust in the grace of God. Now, there'll be other sermons. Jim's going to preach one next week. It'll be a great one. I hadn't heard a bad one come out of his mouth yet. Uh... Danny will be preaching again, and we'll look forward to that. There'll be other topics other days. We'll, talk, we'll have sermons on repentance. We'll have sermons on uh, sanctification. We'll have sermons on how to love your wife and love your husband and your children. And There are lots of sermons. God's got lots to say to us. But right now, today, the message for today is trusting in the grace of God. Trusting in the grace of God. If you have never been baptized because you don't think you're good enough, friend, you're going to be waiting a long time. To think that you would ever deserve the holy, righteous Son of God coming down out of heaven and dying on the cross for you Ooh, you're going to be waiting a long time. It's all about grace. It's good news about grace. Pastor Jim and I have discussed this, and we are going to do something a little bit different. We're not done yet here. We're going to do something very similar to the early church, right out of the book of Acts. We want to provide an opportunity for anyone who has never been baptized to either come forward and be baptized right now with that water and don't think I can't get you wet with that water. Baptized right now in front of God and everybody. That's the first invitation. And I'll give it in just a minute. Or... I invite you to come forward and if you've never been baptized and tell us you want to be baptized and we'll arrange a time for you and Pastor Danny to talk and you'll be baptized then. Was that clear enough? If you've never been baptized and you want to be baptized right now, Jim and I are going to be standing right there and you just come down and we'll baptize you right here. Or if you want to come and say, I want to be baptized. I don't want Brother Danny to do it. Hallelujah. We will have a prayer for you and support that. I'm going to take just a minute. It's an opportunity to respond. We'll leave that as an open invitation, all right? So if the Spirit moves you later on, that's all right. We're on God's time schedule here. I have another invitation. Maybe you were baptized as an infant. Maybe you were baptized during your confirmation experience and you didn't have any more idea what was going on than anything. God was faithful. God has kept his end of the bargain. But maybe you didn't keep yours. 
And you need to make a commitment of your life to Christ. You need to respond by saying, I want Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior this day. This day. Maybe you thought you had to wait until you're good enough, and I hope you got it. It's all about grace. So, second invitation. If that's you, and God is nudging you to come forward, then Brother Jim and I are going to meet you right here. You come forward. We'll have a prayer with you. If you want to recommit your life to Christ, keep your end of the covenant of baptism bargain. God has kept his. We'll take just a minute. If anybody wants to come forward, Brother Jim and I will meet you right here. I remember sitting out there and uh, at that old revival service, and I thought, you know, that girl I like is down there, and she's going to think I'm stupid if I stand up and go forward. And I remember sweating palms. But I got up, and I went forward anyway. I thought, you know, committing my life to Christ is a whole lot more valuable than what people think of me. Or a little bit of embarrassment or whatever. I invite you to come if you'd like to make a rededication of your life to Christ. I'm, I'm sorry. We do that while they're having communion. They do that while we can do that. Yes. When you come forward. Well, the next invitation. It's for everybody. Nobody's getting out of here uh, without having an opportunity to respond to grace. Okay. So here's the last invitation. And that is, when you come forward for communion, I want you first to come to the water. Boy, that's got a biblical sound to it, doesn't it? Just come to the water. <laughs> Come to the water. And uh, you put a finger or two fingers in there. Put the sign of the cross on your head. And I want you to say that response that the children said. I am trusting in the grace of God. And you're right. This, this, is, this one's for everybody. Anybody. Baptized, not baptized. Saint. Center, as Danny says, uh, when you come, let the water remind you of God's grace. That's what it's about. Don't wait till you're good enough. God's good enough. And that's what grace is all about. Okay? I'm trusting in the grace of God. And then. Uh, There'll be some over here, receive the bread, dip it in the cup, uh, receive the body and blood of Christ. Those over here, take the bread, dip it in the cup. Come to the water first. Brother Jim. Invitation. You are invited. On the night that 
Jesus was betrayed, he gave an invitation. He took bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat this. And as you do, whenever you do, do it in remembrance of me. He took the cup. He said to his disciples, this is a cup of a new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins and for the sins of many. Drink this in remembrance of me. God, we praise you that you chose us before we ever thought of choosing you. We praise you for sending your son, Jesus, and the mighty act of the cross and the power of the resurrection. Because Jesus is alive, life is available to us. Pour out your spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. that we might be the body of Christ for the world. That we would be in reconciliation with you and with our neighbors and with our families and with the people that we work with, the people in our neighborhood. We might be the body and the blood and the feet and the hands and the mouth of Christ. Amen. We're going to have to be a little flexible today that we invite those who are coming to serve to just stand on either side of the water. And as these folks come from the side, as Pastor Scott has invited you, visit the water first. So we'll just have two stations that stay stationary. And I think we can figure out how to get to these. And I am the water to say that phrase out loud just step out on faith a little bit I'm trusting in the grace of God and if we all hear you say it hallelujah
because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. wonderful morning. It's been great to be able to experience that with you. Something that's really special is that in just a few minutes, another group of people, your brothers and sisters in the faith, will gather together for worship. And then after that, another group of your brothers and sisters will gather together for worship in the spirit of communion and community. And then at 1215, for those of you who are hardcore you can come back for the slideshow and at 6 or 4 o'clock for the movie. But just allow yourself to make this the Lord's day. It's not over now. It's just getting started today. Mm, amen. We're going to forego the, the full final song so that we can set the stage for our center point service. So perhaps we could just reprise the song we just... Well, I was going to say, we'll okay. just sing it as the... However we'll, you we'll do it, out. yeah. But put up your hands. I dare you. This is not a stick up. <laughs> God. But we, we are surrendering. We are trusting in your grace. Mm. And in your yeah. grace, we will move yeah. and we will act and speak mm. and we will do the things that Jesus would do. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go now in that power and peace. Amen. Oh! 